Thank you for watching this online class presentation from Cedarville University. All Cedarville students complete a Bible minor as part of their undergraduate degree program, where they learn to apply scripture to every aspect of their lives. The five course sequence includes the Bible and the Gospel, Old and New Testament literature, and two theology courses. We invite you to learn more at cedarville.edu. So we're, we're in though the midst of this person of Christ unit right now. So we, a while back, last week, we're talking through a sevenfold kind of outline that he was prophesied, and we thought through various Old Testament texts on that, that he was born, thinking of the virgin birth especially there, uh, that he lived, that's where we are right now in our outline, we'll come back to that, that he died, that he rose, one, two, three, four, five, that he ascended, which most don't think about it very, very often, but he did ascend to the Father and he intercedes for us. And then that he will return. So we'll hit more of the death of Christ and the work of Christ next unit. And then the return in that thing called eschatology, which is more like the last things, end times kind of stuff. We'll touch on it though, briefly. So we got here last time in terms of life. Uh, thinking through baptism, temptation, ministry of miracles, and transfiguration. We got through his baptism last time and thought some details there. Let's turn to uh, Matthew 4. Let's go to Matthew 4, if you have Bibles. And think on some things here in terms of his temptation. Matthew 4. So We all know the story pretty well, I think, if we're... If we're uh, Tracking with sermons that are preached, this is the one that you hear a fair amount, at least, I have. So he is baptized, <clears throat> Jesus is. He then, it says in verse 1, uh, is led up by, by who, by the way? The Spirit, key to see there, especially Luke's gospel, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So the Spirit comes down on him at the baptism, now leads him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, uh, who else spent time in the wilderness in the Old Testament? Elijah did. Who else? Say again. John did in the New Testament. Yeah. Israel did for 40 years. right? So there, there's a lot of wilderness imagery you see throughout the scriptures. We picked up here as well. And the tempter came and said to him. So you guys have to look. What, what, what are the three temptations that, that are received by Jesus here? What are they? Turn the stones into bread. Okay. What else? Yeah, jump off the pinnacle of the temple, and Herod's temple was big, really big. And the angels will catch you. And what does Satan do there, by the way, in that temptation, number two? He quotes scripture. Man, oh man, so he's quoting from uh, Psalm 91, saying there, hey, the angels will catch you, so go ahead and do that. Third one is what? Worship. Yeah, yep, bow down and worship. The kingdoms of the, of the earth will all be yours. So those are the major Temptations brought to Jesus after he's fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, by the way, I love John's detail here, if you notice this, uh, in verse 2. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I I'm just like, really? That's a great little detail. Now, I was part of a ministry. I, I joke with this, but it's not really a joke. Because I was part of a ministry that in the fall, we as a ministry fasted for a week uh, from food. And then in the spring, we spent two weeks where we fasted and prayed for the ministry. It's only 14, not 40. And I'm telling you, at the end of 14 days, I didn't need to turn stones into bread. I was ready to eat rocks. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Like, if you haven't done that before, I'm like, I'll eat, I'll eat anything at this point. So, uh, like, is that a legit temptation? Uh, yeah, hunger's real. So 40 days is, is a legit thing. It's real. So, with that, every time he's tempted, and you guys know this, what does Jesus do in response? He quotes scripture every time. So typically, in preaching, the application we'll hear is, hey, if, if you're tempted by, by the devil, the flesh, the world, you should fight back with scripture and quote pertinent verses to fight against those things. That's a good application. It really is. Beyond that, though, there's something more to see, I think. So um, where does Jesus quote from? Old Testament, true, but it's from one book in the Old Testament. It's from all three times he quotes from Deuteronomy. 
Deuteronomy 6 and 8, three times out of those. Now, I'm not sure what you do. Maybe you're thinking Deuteronomy 6 and 8 for your own like, temptation times and saying that's where I'm going every time. I, not necessarily the default for me. <clears throat> so he's going there, and it's interesting because he goes through and says, No, man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that comes to the mouth of God. Then later on, he says, You should not put the Lord your God to the test, and then you should worship the Lord your God and serve him only. We don't have time right now, but if you were to go back to those verses, Deuteronomy, we got it here in the, the footnotes here, 8, 3, 6, 16, and 6, 13, those verses, if you read them in context, what's going on there is those are moments recounted by Moses where Israel failed. He's recounting times in the wilderness where you guys failed. Can you please not forget we don't just live by manna alone, complainers? We live by the words that proceed from God's mouth. And oh, when you did this, don't forget, we're called to worship God only, not idols. Right? We're called to do this and not this. So he's quoting from contexts where Moses is recounting Israel's failures. So in a way, just to go on here for the notes, in a way, Jesus, I think, is trying to say to us, yes, quote scripture, yes, fight well in that way, but I think he's also trying to say to us, in essence, man, Israel failed, Adam as well, failed, and where they failed, I'm quoting scripture to show you guys, I am not going to fail. I'm going to keep God's word and do what he's calling me to do. The Son of God will do all that he's called to do, the Father's will, perfectly. So, just to note that for us, to say, yes, quote scripture, but also say, he's showing us, as Israel did not do and Adam didn't do, I am this new Adam, new Israel, new Moses, new David, if you will, that is keeping the covenant of God and doing all these things perfectly. It's good news because at the end of the day, real fast application, uh, we fail in temptation all the time. And Jesus says, I never failed. So we can look to the one who never failed as the means of our righteousness, not just our own righteousness. That's good to keep in mind. So, we have that idea there. Now, really briefly, uh, Hebrews 4 says that Jesus is tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Okay? So we've got Jesus here. I said it last time, he is fully blank and fully blank. So he's fully, fully what? God? Yeah, I heard that. Fully God and fully man. There we go. Okay? So the author of Hebrews says he's tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So James 1, this is one of these kind of perplexing ideas. Look at James 1, verse 13, says, Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So Jesus is fully God and fully man. James 1.13 says God cannot be tempted. He embodies this. So a question that is raised often is, okay, so how, how is Jesus actually tempted if God cannot be tempted? And how is he, Hebrews says also, a faithful high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses? Because again, it's like, well, but you're God, the God man. And I'm just a man or a woman. I feel this in ways that seemingly you didn't, Jesus. So how does that, how does that all work? And so there's, there's lots of answers to this question. A lot of attempts try to get at, you know, how does all this work? One way is to say the temptations were external. They were real. They were legitimate. And internally, as the God-man, right, he is not going to sin in that kind of a way. So you recognize, okay, that's a way to say there, there's external and internal kinds of realities going on. Temptation is real, but internally, who he is is also saying, well, I'm not going to go in that direction. Okay, fair enough. One other piece to say is this. Turn to Luke really quick. Luke 3. This could raise more questions theologically, but I want to just go through this to help us think through, not just, okay, he's the God-man, temptation, not temptation, and, and here... Here's some, some theological terms. People debate what's called uh, impeccability, which means that Jesus is not able to sin. 
versus, this sounds weird, but peckability. <laughs> Which some would say Jesus is able to sin. So let's start, let's start with easy things. Did Jesus sin? No. Okay, so we'll start there and just say, okay, we'll start baseline and say he did not, therefore he can be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Got that. Now the question is, okay, but was there capability of him being able to do this? Well, this is a very, 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 very minority view that he was able to sin because God doesn't sin. So most would say this, he wasn't able to sin, but how do, I, how do I reconcile that with these verses in Hebrews that say he was tempted as we are, and he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses? Well, here, here's a thought and an analogy. So in Luke, we'll start in Luke uh, chapter 3 here. Right, so we just read this, but um, in verse 21, Jesus is baptized. In verse 22, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Luke is about the Holy Spirit. Luke also wrote what book? Acts. A little bit about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts as well, right? He's got a lot in there. So just note that. So I already got a few mentions of the Holy Spirit. Verse 14, chapter 4. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and a report went out about him. And then he goes on. Uh, to receive this scroll on the Sabbath day. Hey, you want to read something, Jesus? Sure. Give that Isaiah scroll. Bring that on over. Opens it up, finds Isaiah, well, our Isaiah, Isaiah 61. There's no chapter divisions there. He finds, though, where it says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to <coughs> preach good news to the poor, etc., etc., etc. Luke's got a lot of emphasis, and I think this is missing a lot of times in our Christology, on the Spirit's relationship to Jesus. That, that, Jesus is the God-man, yes, but Luke's going out of his way to say, in the Spirit, in the Spirit, in the Spirit, Jesus did this. Later on, Luke says, or, well, Jesus says, if it's by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Well, the kingdom of God has come, Jesus said so, so it must be. Jesus cast out demons by the power of the Spirit. So we, we tend to forget this relationship in terms of Jesus operating in some way, in some measure, by the power of the Spirit. So here's an analogy, a way to say this, that I think is helpful in some ways, though again, it doesn't answer everything. Um, let's say, uh, I'm just going to pick Josh here. So Josh, I don't know if you're a swimmer or not, but I'll just choose for swimming. So let's say Josh is an epic, amazing, awesome swimmer, and he's like, man, I have this goal uh, to break the world record for swimming the furthest distance without stopping which is a hundred and some odd miles, by the way. It's a crazy amount of, of distance. And so he trains, and he's here at Cedarville, so he just runs, a, he does a lot of laps at Cedar Lake, back and forth now. But he finds a big lake, bigger than that probably, and uh, goes and trains. And one day, uh, as he's training, uh, he gets a cramp in his leg. He has to like, kind of go over to the shore and, and stop. Like, man, if I, if I do this in open water and I cramp up, I'm gonna like drown. I don't wanna die yet. So Micah, thankfully, Micah's got a boat. And uh, he owns a boat. So he says, hey, Micah and their friends, would you be willing to, like, in your boat, just, like, be behind me, like, 20, 30 feet, in case uh, I was to cramp up and not be able to make it the whole way through this, uh, this attempt at this world record? And he says, sure, no problem at all. So they train, do all that. A good friend, appreciate that. So um, the day the event comes, and Josh, in the words of Dory, just keeps swimming, right? So... He just goes, and Josh is there trolling behind him uh, with a boat, and he keeps on going, and eventually he breaks that world record, right? So we all celebrate, yay, fantastic. And uh, there's two questions we can ask. Uh, why did Josh, oh, I'm sorry, why could Josh not have drowned during that attempt? Why could he not have drowned during that attempt? Yeah, you have the boat behind you, right? So there's something there to take care of you in case you cramp up. So why couldn't he? Boat's there. Why did he not drown? He didn't cramp up to begin with. Say again? Because he didn't cramp up to begin with. He didn't cramp up. He just kept swimming and got all the way through, right? So he swam, got through it, didn't cramp, and, and there he goes. So why could he and why, he, why did he are different answers. 
Why could he not drown was the boat's there. Why did he not? He kept swimming. So I think there's something there to say with Jesus' temptation. Why could Jesus not succumb to temptation, or uh, to sin and temptation? He's God. So why could he not succumb to sin and temptation? He's God. Why did he not? It seems as though Luke's going out of his way to say Jesus didn't succumb to sin through temptation because he was relying on the Spirit of God, as you see here in Luke several times, fill the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, to do what he was called to do and walk in obedience to the Father's will. Now that's encouraging, and I can move on here, but that's encouraging because we have the same Spirit. We are, we are not, this is not our identity. We are not the God-man. God, woman. That's not how we are, okay? But the way in which he operated to overcome sin, Luke seems to portray this as a, a means, which is the Holy Spirit, whom you have in you, indwelling you, right? Residing in you, filling you. So the way in which Jesus came under temptation and resisted and obeyed is the same means we can also take advantage of. He couldn't, because he's God. We can, we're not God. But the means of overcoming temptation and sin would be the Spirit of God for us as well. Word of God, Spirit of God, working in combination in that way. Make sense? Make sense? Seeing some nods. That's, for me, it's a helpful thing to think through um, how Hebrews actually makes sense. And how, like 1 Peter 2 says, Jesus set you an example to walk in his footsteps. 1 John 2 says it as well. And you say, how? I'm not God. And I think that's one, one way to think about that idea at a, at a broader level. Max, you go ahead. So we see, see the two truths in Scripture that one, Christ absolutely did not sin. Yes. And two, that he was indeed tempted as we are. Yes. So what then is the importance of seemingly taking this a step further to look at whether or not he was able to sin? Because it doesn't seem to be the question presented in Scripture whether or not he was able. It seems to be whether he sinned. Mm -hmm. That's the big one. That, that is the big one, by the way. The first one, did he? The second one was what again? Whether he was tempted. Gotcha. This is why I'm trying to say I agree with you. And what I'm trying to say is these are typical theological categories. And the route that I want to go instead more often is try to think about the spirit and the way in which we follow in his footsteps as opposed to trying to say could he or couldn't he. Because I think we, I hope we all agree, like, Jesus is not, I would say, He's not able to sin because he's God. Then, how to reconcile that with the idea of Hebrews 4, 1 Peter 2, etc.? That's my next question. So I think this is a fair starting point, but you have to be beyond that to think through as well. Okay, but then by what means did he do this? And by what means do I obey as I'm called to obey and walk in his footsteps? So that's, a, I think, more important thing to get to than just settling here and saying, like, uh, that, I'm good. Yeah. Just, those are typical theological ways they would try to get at it. I'm trying to get beyond that as well. It's good. Good question. Any other questions there on that? I think it's 8.25. I know we're, we're getting rolling here. It's a lot early in the morning. Okay, let's press on here then. Ministry of Miracles. This, this is a lot of the Gospels, right? I mean, a lot of the Gospels is Jesus ministering, man, healing people, Casting out demons, raising the dead, uh, a lot of things there. But first, even before that, uh, he's a teacher. I'm about to, I'm finishing Old Testament here soon. I've got Second Chronicles left in the Old Testament, then get into, into Matthew, my reading the Bible in a year. I'm excited to hear again from Jesus the teachings that he has for us. They're not always easy to, to hear and say, I've, I've got to do more and see more grace of God in my life for that particular thing to obey, that idea there, but he teaches a lot. In John especially, he will do some kind of miracle, some kind of action with a crowd, and then a long discourse about, hey, what I just did signifies this spiritual truth. Healing a blind man, right? he's like, yeah, this is to show Pharisees, by the way, that you're blind, not physically, but spiritually. You're not seeing what you need to see. He does that a lot. Beyond that, he preaches the kingdom of God. I mean, can you imagine? Because John the baptizer and Jesus had the same first sermon. It's all I've recorded in the Bible anyway. Which says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's all we have. 
That'd be an amazing five-second chapel sermon, right? Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Dismissed. Can you imagine? Right. So, just trying to say there, that's a very, very significant thing. He preaches the kingdom of God, uh, which we'll come back to in eschatology. Can I just say, we don't often talk about the kingdom of God. We're confused about the kingdom of God. We ignore the kingdom of God. And Jesus, Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations in Matthew 24. So it must be important. If, if he's saying it's, it's important, then it's important. So if you want to jot down really quick, um, one way I think about the kingdom of God and, and what that, in fact, is, uh, it's God's people in God's place under God's rule. It's, it's a way to just say it simply. It's God's people in God's place under God's rule. So it involves, a kingdom involves a people. That's those who are called by God, Christians, believers, in a place. Right now, it's, it's, it's little like kingdom embassies all over planet Earth. We call them local churches. Okay? You know what an embassy is in a foreign country? It's like if you step in these doors right here, even though you're in Germany, you're now in America. Well, there's lots of kingdom of God embassies all over planet Earth. We call them local churches. And then under God's rule and reign. Right? Like right now, coming under his word, someday the place will be, you know, everywhere. <laughs> New creation. Someday the rule will be totalizing, manifest, and present. That's the way I think of God's kingdom in that sense. He's, he's preaching that, saying, it's inaugurated, it's begun in me, and it'll come in, in fullness someday. Uh, so, he does this in terms of parables, right? The growth of the kingdom, all sorts of things there. Lots of parables in Matthew 13 about like uh, how the kingdom has to grow and, and do all that kind of stuff and, and how it's like, hey, it's like a mustard seed. It's like uh, yeast. I, I'm still, I'm, I'm a simpleton, man. I'm still amazed by like, we'll make homemade either pizza or calzones almost every Friday night at the Kimball house. That's what we have. When you come to our house, you have homemade pizza at our place. It's always, I think, very good. And I'm always amazed, like you throw dough into a bowl, you cover it with a, a dish towel, you go away for an hour, and you come back, and it grew. I'm, I'm always amazed by that. I'm like, it grew again. It's amazing. You know, so that's what happens. He's trying to say there, the kingdom of God is growing. It's a, it's a uh, just in terms of thinking through here, it's a already, like, begun, like, in seed form, and in, in small dough kind of form, at 13, but it's not yet fully here. It's going to grow into a tree, grow into a, a big thing of, of dough there. So it's, it's already not yeah, have you heard that, that phrase before in, in New Testament literature or something like that? Yes? Okay, so the example I give on this really quick is um, thinking through my own hiring here at Cedarville. I was hired here in 2013, and I, got a, I think I told you, I got a phone call on July 31st, 2013. It started like August 15th, 2013. So I had two whole weeks to get ready to do a brand new thing at Cedarville, which is tons of fun. So I, I go through all of these phone interviews, Dr. White. Dr. Lee, the, the AVP, the AAVP, HR people, like all these phone calls, all these interviews, all this paperwork, all this stuff. Finally, I don't know, August like 13th, Dr. White says, congrats, you're officially hired to be faculty at Cedarville. And I was like, yeah, right on. So there it is. And I get there and I go to my computer to log on. I've got a an username and password on this sheet of paper. And I go to log in and it won't let me log in. Try again, try again, try again. Can't log in. I uh, talked to then Zach Bowden, who's the assistant to the president here, friend of mine now, and said, hey, I can't log on. And he's on his phone, and, and he uh, calls HR, human resources, talking to them about some things. And uh, now my very good friend John Davis, a guy that I love, is a very close friend of mine, uh, said, yeah, Jeremy can't log on because Jeremy's not officially an employee. And I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The man, Dr. White said, I am an employee, therefore I am an employee. And he said, yeah, that's nice, uh, but your background check hasn't cleared. And until it does, you're not. And so this is what I said to him on the phone. I was like, John, I promise I've not done anything criminal. Does that count? <laughs> that's what I said to him. And he's like, yeah, no, that doesn't count at all. I'm like, okay, so I, I was already the president of the place, which matters a lot, said, you're in. HR man, John Davis says, 
I, he may say you, you've, you've already begun as an employee and you're doing things already that are employee kinds of things, which I was, but you're, you're not yet in the full reality, brother, because HR holds your paycheck. It's part of the reality. So, so I, I eventually got through all that, thankfully. <coughs> Background check cleared, all that kind of thing. But a way to say, Jesus is saying, listen, already this kingdom is infiltrating planet Earth, but someday in full Right? The glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. I asked theology one student, like, how extensively do the waters cover the sea? And at times, the ones class are kind of like, uh. So, 100%, that's the point in Habakkuk and Isaiah. Like, waters cover the sea. I was like, well, what about tides? Forget tides. 100%. That's the point of their, their analogy there, right? That's coming someday. Okay, good stuff. Uh, on as well, cast out demons. Heals the sick, right? They show his identity as the Son of God. Uh, he doesn't perform miracles on demand. Remember the earliest moments? Show us a sign. And he's like, man, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. And he's not like a on-demand kind of magician. It's not who he is. It's not what he does. He does these things very um, strategically. He does it when he sees faith expressed by people, even if it's weak, like help my unbelief kinds of faith. Uh, he does it as a way to say, see what I did here. I'm doing this to show you this kind of spiritual reality. So, you got there. Sign of the kingdom, response to faith, compassion. There's just moments where Jesus just moved with compassion, it says, for the people. And one time in the Gospels, one time, it seems, in John 2, the turning of water to wine, it was to awaken faith of people there who were just... Not aware of what was going on. One of the here for his life would be another moment where he th thinks, this is an interesting kind of a, a scene, which is his transfiguration. Remember this? So he's doing miracles, doing ministry. He's called disciples. He's got 12 disciples. Well, he's got more than that as well that do various things of ministry. Uh, and then at one point, he goes up to a mountain. Peter, James, and John are with him. And he is, it says in these texts here, uh, transfigured. He is changed. He is, sh it's almost like the, the, uh, the wrappings peeled away to showcase the glory of Jesus. Like the gospel has tried to describe it and say like his, his clothing was like, it was like lots and lots of bleach kind of a thing. And there's a light that shone and there's glory there, which harkens back to a lot of Old Testament and Revelation kinds of moments where there's this Shekinah light of glory around the Lord. Uh, so, showing there that kind of idea and who he is in his fullness as well. And uh, I, th I think in many ways, uh, just showcasing, don't forget this is who I, in fact, am. Peter recognized this as well. He's accompanied by who, by the way, at the Transfiguration? Who, who shows up? Moses and Elijah. Why? Like, why those two? I mean, we, can only, we only surmise and say why in the text, but why do you think? Yeah. I mean, they were kind of like Old Testament big weights, weren't they? They sure were, absolutely. So Moses, uh, he, wrote, he wrote this thing called, we call it the law, right? Pentateuch, first five books, really important foundation there. Elijah is one of the most important, what? Prophets. So we see here in, in some way, I can't make this case, you know, wholesale and say there it is, but um, Jesus in Matthew 5 especially says, like, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. He's operating as a new Moses, right? He's speaking prophetically. You've heard it said, don't murder. But I say to you, it's not just external things, it's the heart things, right? So he's, he's showing that in those ways. He's speaking prophetically, and those two could be there to demonstrate, okay, Jesus is embodying this perfect fulfillment of the law, and speaking as this perfect prophet, like Deuteronomy 18 said he would be. Some thoughts there to keep in mind. Then on to his death. Let's go to his death here as well. Uh, and not, not much here. We'll do a lot more next unit with this. But just to say this is the focal point of the New Testament. A lot of prophecies Roughly one-third of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, one-third of them are dedicated to 
the death of Christ, the pa Passion Week, I should say. So that week leading up to the death of Jesus, that's one-third of the Gospels. So they go through Palm Sunday on through. Uh, Paul calls the cross and the resurrection the most important points in the Gospel. And I, I don't want to pass over that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. And if you don't, probably you guys know this, but if you don't, just say one of the best summaries of the Gospel in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. If you know it, great. If you don't, write that down. One of the best summaries of the Gospel in the Bible is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It's a great, great, great summary. Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance, that's right, first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. All right, so we have that, that idea of death and resurrection of Jesus as being first importance for Christians. Got to get that. Got to know that. Um, so we'll talk a ton about that because that's been, man, oh man, Jesus' death has been interpreted every which way. I mean, beyond what seems to be the plain, simple way of him objectively dying on our behalf for our sins, it's been taken a thousand directions. So we'll talk about that later on in there as well. But man, it's a great, great chance to see who Christ is and what he's done and why that is so significant. And death, yes, but don't just say death, say death and Resurrection. Both. Right? Uh, so, I'll even ask you guys here a question about this as well. Uh, this is the heart of the Christian faith. If he's buried in the ground, Jesus, still, then 1 Corinthians 15 says, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why? Because if he wasn't resurrected, we won't be resurrected. Right? So, if he's in the ground somewhere, don't waste your time. Go find a hobby for your Sundays and uh, do something else. But if he is, and he is, then that changes everything in our lives, right? So we see its apologetic importance. In other words, that it's, it's a major question raised about the Christian faith. We need to defend our faith with that. Well, some guy rose from the dead, seriously? And there's theological things as well. But without looking at notes, because they're probably listening to the notes there, but... Do you just think of, have you heard of evidences that have been given in terms of uh, why we can say the resurrection is a real event and not some fictitious thing? Any, any evidences you guys have heard over the years about that? Yeah? Because there are so many eyewitnesses. Okay, big one. Eyewitnesses. We've got, who we have? I mean, first we've got the women, right, that are there. Then we've got, I mean, Peter and John raced down there, right, to the tomb. Then the disciples see them. Uh, later on in the upper room. And then 1 Corinthians 15 says, actually, as well, um, he appeared to Peter, then the 12, then verse 6, you're still turned there, it says, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers. What's the next phrase? At one time. Why is that significant? No one could deny it. Yeah, no one could deny it because, I mean, mass hallucination is uh, with 500 people is a hard one to, to have happen. You know what I'm saying? So he's trying to say here, 500 at one time. Don't doubt this. All these people saw him at one time. It's not just some lie that's going on there. Uh, it says most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. So go ask them. Go talk to them. So eyewitness accounts, big one. Anything else? You guys have heard for evidences for the resurrection? Yeah, Josh. I would say the expansion of the gospel amidst persecution. Good. So, go, like, why, like, why would that be an evidence for the resurrection? Because why would people basically put themselves under persecution when it seems like they were made for the game? And they know that it's a lie, right? So people die for lies all the time, right? You have, you have cult followings where people like will, will sacrifice their lives and say, I, I believe in this. But when you know that something is a lie and you're perpetrating the lie, man, do, do you all know how the disciples died? You guys aware of these, these deaths? So I, I was many, many, many moons ago a youth pastor. This is many years ago now. And uh, one thing I did there was teach Bible at a Christian school at this, this, uh, this job I had at the church. And um, in Bible class, I had to do a creative project in the, the semester. This is juniors and seniors. And one group decided to take a, a giant poster board and divide it into 12 quadrants 
and depict artistically uh, the deaths of the disciples. Now, we don't, it's by, by tradition, we don't know all the, the details per se, um, but what we have by tradition, these guys died horrific deaths by being dragged behind a chariot until they died, or being stoned, or um, being flayed, or being crucified upside down, or on and on it goes. Not, not fun things. You think, man, if, if that were to be the case, would someone willingly do that for what they know in fact to be a lie that they're perpetrating? Yeah. Any others? You guys heard? Evidence of this resurrection? There's a couple of good ones. There's a few more that I have as well here. Uh, would be, there's unanimity in testifying that Jesus truly died. So some, well, that's the next slide. Do you guys have in your, in your notes a picture, an image on the next page or anything? I don't, think, I don't see it. I'll send it to you. Because I, I, I have this picture there from a, a book called Visual Theology. Someone articulated, hey, like it's called the swoon theory. Like uh, Jesus, it seemed as though he was dead, but he wasn't really. He just bled out a lot and looked as though he was dead and got in the tomb. They sealed it with you know, the rock and all that. And then like, he just pushed his way out. He came back, you know, resuscitated, came back to life, pushed his way out, and went on his way. Yeah, now, some of you guys are in, like, pre-med fields. So I can talk, I just let you talk now and say, so how, after you've been crucified and, and hung there for hours and suffocated and also been flogged before that and jabbed in the, the heart by a spear. I just wonder how that's going badly. Anyway, so that's not a, that's not a good explanation, right? Uh, Jesus' friends... On Saturday, what are they doing? Man, they're mourning. They're not expecting a resurrection. So that actually strengthens the case of, they weren't there conspiring like, hey, let's steal his body and do this. They're there being like, what do we do? What's next? Right? Silly one, but the tomb's empty. And there are eyewitness accounts even beyond the gospel writers who testify to this. Now there's explanations like, oh, it's time to stole the body or this, but... Even the Romans say, hey, the tomb's empty. You've got to account for that somehow. He appeared, eyewitnesses there, like Joshua, persecution and death, we see that as well. So just some ways to see this and try to think through um, that whole idea. And now I'll tell you what, I was, I was impressed. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not always impressed with uh, what we call like, Christian movies. Uh, it's not always the case for me. I watched uh, The Case for Christ, which is Lee Strobel's story. This past summer with my family, I mean, I, I was helped by that. That was a really neat depiction of him as an atheist journalist trying to think through, this is one piece. It's like everything hinges on this. And he's trying to go through and, and look at all these theories and, and debunk them as an atheist. And again and again and again, they're saying, well, here's, here's some realities to look at. So it was, it was a helpful way to look at that and that high, whole idea and how it works. So um, I have an image here. You can't possibly read that. But... Uh, there are various, I can say this image if you guys want this, but there's certain things like, hey, there's a swoon theory, he didn't actually die, everyone hallucinated and thought they saw him, it was a spiritual resurrection, or someone stole the body, or they went to the wrong tomb. Hey, it's empty! Oh, wrong tomb. Right? So, all these, so then, then uh, Tim Challies goes over here, you can't really read these, and say, no, 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 all these would be wrong, and he gets this whole, this whole list of saying why those just, this, they can't hold. Those theories of the, the resurrection can, cannot hold water at all. So because you, if you want to come this close and get a picture with your phone, I guess you can, but I can send it to you as well so you guys can read that. But Visual Theology by Tim Challies, it came from that book. It's a great book on theology in that sense. But to press on here, why does it matter? The resurrection, uh, it vindicates the work of the cross. If he only dies, there's a problem. Because all throughout his life, Jesus said, I'm going to die and rise again, right? Destroy this temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. The Son of Man must suffer many things, but in three days he'll rise. If that's not happening, he's not who he said he was. Uh, he's God's Son, Romans 1.4 says. It guarantees our resurrection, which is good news. And it's the basis for Christ's ascension and exaltation, which is what we're going to finish out with here very, very quickly. So, ascension, return. So, ascension. 
people could ask the question, like, why didn't Jesus just stay and say, hey, I rose from the dead, and here I am, so believe in me. No, not his plan. He goes, he sends followers of his to make disciples of all nations, who are filled with the Spirit to go do those things. And he goes from there, and he ascends to the right hand of the Father, where he intercedes as our great high priest, it says in Hebrews several times. So he makes intercession for his people, which is really profoundly good news as our great high priest. Yes, we're priests, 1 Peter 2 says, as believers, but Jesus is our great high priest. And he mediates for us, between us and the Father, in that kind of a way, which is a beautiful kind of reality. So, prophesied, born, lived, died, rose, ascended. This is Acts 1, when he ascends. And then finally, and we'll have a lot more on this down the road here, he returns. Will, I'm sorry, he will return. Hasn't returned yet. We're awaiting the return of the king, right? That's what we're awaiting. There will come a day when Jesus will return to set up his kingdom to rule and to reign forever. So I'm just going to read one text because it's good. And we hardly ever read 2 Thessalonians. But it's a good book. Obviously. All right. So, he says here in verse 6, Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, this is his return here, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. He's going to return and glorify himself in salvation and in judgment. That's a reality. He will glorify himself in salvation and judgment when he returns. That's going to be the case. So we want to be on that side receiving his salvation. So that's, that's the idea there in terms of his being prophesied, born, lived, died, rose, ascended, and returned. Now, from there, just preview, we want to think through some his history. Because history is going to help us here to think through present day people who would say alternative things about Jesus. For example, and we get out of here. This is a, this is a doctrinal statement we'll start off on Friday with. Where someone says, he, Jesus, is the Son of God, he came to earth from heaven and gave his perfect life as a ransom sacrifice, his death and resurrection made his eternal life possible. He's now really the king of God's heavenly kingdom, which will soon bring peace to the entire earth. You're like, yeah, sounds good. And it goes on. Jesus never claimed the quality of God and thus is not part of a trinity. That, that's all actually one paragraph is how that all goes in this, this statement. So for next time, you have to jot it down if you don't want to, but think about, I'm going to ask you guys up front, just so you know on Friday, first thing, I want to ask you guys, okay, how would you respond to this statement with Bible? Where would you go immediately to say, no, Jesus divinity, right here. 